So hello everyone and, and welcome to this issue briefing on a very timely topic. Um, is there going to be a financial crisis in 2018? Apparently this is a question that many people ask themselves, although the conditions right now seems to be very good. 4% GDP growth in the world economy, uh, stock markets are booming, or, or maybe that's the reason why we are discussing this. Um, and joining me here on stage today to discuss these, this topic are two distinguished panelists. Helen Ray from the London Business School, a professor there in international economics, a, a really a distinguished expert on international financial markets and, and one of a, her generation's leading <coughs> economists. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. And we're also joined by Michael Bolson, President and CEO of DTCC, uh, which really is the, the backbone of, of Wall Street. Uh, and you're the one who really oversees all the, the flows, yeah. transactions. We, we like to call ourselves the plumbers of Wall Street. But <laughs> the plumbers. If anything happens, you will notice. That, that's, that's for sure. And, and you have a, a very long industry experience uh, from the financial market and, and leading several leading business roles uh, in the financial system. So we're privileged to have you both here. So let's, let's get started. Uh, and why not go back to the last crisis? Um, because one question is, are we still feeling the aftermaths of, of that crisis? And, and to 2008, I remember in uh, just a day or two after Lehman Brothers crashed, uh, I, I attended a seminar at Harvard together with Ken Rogoff, an international economist. And I remember he, he was really shocked by what was happening at that time. Uh, Elaine, if I, I begin with you, do you think 2018 will be a year when we will feel that shock again? So as you know, one of the first rules of an economist is not to make forecast with a firm date on it. <laughs> so uh, I am obviously not saying we're going to have a crisis in, in 2018. Also because uh, we are effectively just recovering from the, the last crisis. However, I think what we are going to talk about uh, is more the, the risks that we can still see in the, in the world economy and in the world financial markets. And uh, to, st to start uh, to kick off this conversation and to link it to the previous crisis, I think what is very, very uh, still a, a big factor of risk, which is still with us, even though, as you mentioned, we have a cyclical pickup, we have the world economy being better, it is still the amount of debt that is in the economy. And uh, there is a lot of debt, and a lot of debt is part of the legacy of a previous crisis. Public so debt. It is both public and private debt. And as we know, in fact, during crisis times, there is a lot of uh, fungibility between what is private and what is public. Sometimes private debt becomes public debt. Uh, there are some bailouts. We have seen that many times, and we will probably uh, see it again. But so what is, I think, pretty striking still at, uh, at this point in time is that we are still dealing with an economy which has a lot of debt. Depending on the countries, the, the emphasis is more on the household debt, or it's more on the financial sector, or it's more on the, uh, public, uh, on the public debt. But what is, um, what is pretty clear for all the macroeconomic research that has been done uh, recently is that debt is a, is a factor of, um, of, of high risk, and uh, especially when, when debt comes after credit booms period. And this is typically what happened in, uh, in the 2008 crisis. We had a massive uh, credit boom, uh, which was in fact very similar to what happened in the 1920s before the 1929 uh, Great Depression. These two episodes, the 2008 and 1929, have a lot of similarity, and both started by massive overvaluation of assets, massive credit booms, and ended up with a financial system meltdown, and these are the, the deepest crisis, the worst type of crisis. So we have just lived through one, and uh, unfortunately, it has left us with this huge debt legacy, which we are still dealing with. Is the last crisis, would you say that the last crisis is over? We're still in the recovery phase? We are, we are in the, re it's, it's, um, fortunately, we are, we are seeing the end of the tunnel, so we are in the recovery, uh, we are in the recovery phase, and we are well in the recovery phase in, in some, uh, uh, in some areas, so there's obviously some, uh, 
differences in the cycles. For example, the US is ahead of, uh, of the euro area, um, but the euro area has been picking up very, very strongly. That is good news. We, there are still some underlying fragility in the euro area. We can, yeah. we can talk we'll about those. We'll go into the details soon. But, but to complement this, uh, this idea of why uh, debt is, is an issue, well, obviously, uh, what determines the cost of debt servicing? It's interest rates. And we are in a phase of ascending interest rate. It's a good news because it means you know, the world is recovering, so interest rates should go up. Uh, this is anticipated uh, uh, by the markets that the interest rate should rise so far, so that's fine. That's also the conditions for a smooth, uh, uh, a smooth uh, recovery. However, uh, there's always you know, a possible danger that interest rate would rise a bit quicker than, than one expects. And in that case, that could have an effect on, on debt servicing, which uh, we hope uh, is one of the scenarios that a lot of risk managers have been considering, but you can, you can never be sure. So that's one of the risk factors. So the plane has, has taken off since, <laughs> since last time, Michael Watson, but is this the year, I'm going to ask you the same question, is this the year where, we'll be, where we will feel the shock again? I think I agree with Helene that if you look at the basic underlying strength of the economies globally, there's nothing to indicate that there's a looming crash. I think we are coming out of the, of the last crisis. The U.S. now, and with the stimulus of the tax cut, is going to be gathering speed and, you know, the, the economy is going to be expanding that much farther. Uh, the growth of the wealth in the emerging markets, I think, is a counter buffer to some of the weaknesses seen elsewhere. Uh, debt is a concern, but if the economies continue to expand, then people should be able to absorb that. So. I don't see a looming economic crisis. The question, you know, what, what is a financial crisis? Could there be a massive market correction? That's where, where I'm more concerned about, is that it's almost a Pollyannish environment right now where, you know, we were talking beforehand, Trump gets elected, everybody thinks the market's going to go down. No, they go up. Brexit happens, everybody thinks the market's going to go down. No, they go up. Um, everybody is getting very used to a low volatility, upward sloping, you know, uh, market backed by a strong set of economies. But what if? What if we have a geopolitical issue? What if we have a housing crisis in China? What if Italy runs into problems? Any of these things. What if you have a massive cyber attack? We can all talk about so the various people, So the market has learned that it's dangerous to sell. Yeah, exactly. Because then you will have to come back and, and yeah. buy at a higher level. Yeah, fear of missing out. Everybody's you know, gaining. Everything's going up. So what happens Is this when? a sign of a bubble? Historically, it has been. And are the markets ready? I mean, everything from risk, you know, you talk about risk managers, but every risk model is based on the volatility that they see, both in the past as well as the near-term future. And nobody is building in a massive change in the volatility profile. Nobody's anticipating a massive drop. So you have this crowd mentality. And when it starts happening, my fear is you'll see almost what happened in 1987 with portfolio insurance, where people start selling into a down correcting market and it just starts exacerbating. And as the volatility picks up, then it just becomes a, a snowball effect. And that, to me, is the bigger impact. Now, does that equate to an economic crisis? I'm not quite sure. Depends on the depth of the, of the drop. But you could see the markets having a very volatile and very violent correction. Market correction, is, is that what you are thinking about as well, Alain Ray? That that is what we will see somewhere down, down the road? So as I said, I mean, I'm not making prediction for 2018 here. Uh, Somewhere, it <laughs> doesn't. Uh, and and uh, what, uh, what we know from past experience is that, indeed, uh, there can be very uh, large market corrections. Now, whether they translate into deep economic trouble or not depends on how the risk is uh, concentrated in the economy and, effectively, which agents bear the risk. Uh, it turns out that uh, what we... Uh, what history tells us is that if there is a risk concentration in the banking system, that's one of the worst possible outcomes, because if there is a banking system meltdown, this is usually a pretty deep economic crisis. Um, now, the, the financial system has undergone uh, very, I think, important uh, changes uh, after the 2008 crisis, partly due to regulation, with Basel III in particular. Uh, and. Uh, more uh, capital more in, capital in, in, the, in the banking system, absolutely. Less leverage as well. Mm -hmm. as That's we know, a good thing, in your opinion. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As we know, leverage was one of the main uh, key drivers of the 2008 uh, crisis and uh, a very big amplification factor. So uh, having uh, 
cat leverage across the financial system, at least the banking system, is a good thing. Now the question, and, and I think that's where uh, we still lack a little bit of expertise, is what these new kind of financial system interconnections look like. Because some of the risk seem to have migrated out of uh, the banking system uh, into uh, other entities, whether they are big asset managers, whether they could be insurance companies, whether they could be other type of actors, uh, CCPs possibly, uh, all the planning that you are talking about. <laughs> so I think uh, at this point in time, we lack in-depth expertise about the interconnections of, of these actors, how vulnerable but, they are but to, do we know where the to risks a number of risks, are, are in particular cyber security. Do we know where the risks are concentrated? Who, who should know this? Well, 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 the regulators, I think, have a much better insight into risk concentrations just, again, through increased supervision, the capital rules. Um, we run a trade repository for over-the-counter swaps that allow regulators to see concentrations of, of risk better than they ever have before. Um, but there is a lot that's moved out. And you talk about dealing with a crisis. Uh, one exercise we do on an annual basis is we simulate um, the failure of a firm. And we do it with our regulators. So we do, and it's just basically a, a firm collapse. Here are their positions with us. Um, how do you liquidate them? And we use an asset manager to simulate the, the liquidation process. And this year, we did a simulation, and we simulated the collapse of five major firms, one after the other. Every two days, a major firm collapses. And what was remarkable, we were able to survive the five collapse and absorb the, the, the collapse. But what was telling was the size of their positions. And we, we only focus on the cash side of the markets, to be clear. So treasuries, mortgage backs, equities, corporate bonds. Um, the size of their open positions with us of the five banks was about $350 billion gross. The size of Lehman Brother was $350 billion gross. Wow. So the five largest banks right now, their positions have shrunk to that extent. And at the same time, obviously, their capital has increased. But our margining, which is what we uh, take in from, uh, from our participants to protect ourselves against a liquidation process, has doubled at the same period. And I think that's very you know, similar to what's happening across the street is the measures of protection have increased, but the risks on, in the banks have definitely decreased. Now, the counter of that is banks have always been seen as a form of a buffer, or at least a first cushion when market corrections happen. They're not going to stand and just get crushed, but they usually will work with clients um, in the first movement. Without that size inventory, the interesting part, again, is that cushion is now probably dissipated. So again, if you get a correction, it's not going to have a, a bump in the road just to slow it down. It may just continue down. So it is a bit of a mixed signal because all these positions have shifted to asset managers, to hedge funds, outside of the you know, directly regulated marketplace. And that, that may not be as well understood. Right. And I, and I would add to that that uh, uh, so we have made some progress in understanding possibly interconnection in uh, domestic uh, jurisdictions. However, I think there is still a lot uh, to be done in terms of uh, data sharing and understanding interconnection across borders. Mm. So it's not that uh, every counterpart is perfectly observed by all the key players, certainly not in the super supervision side. So I think there are still major issues there about uh, how the network of a financial network work, and when it's hit by a shock, how a big shock would unfold through the network. I think mm. we cannot really have a a very good answer to, to big stress test uh, if uh, international entities are, are involved. Now, we, when we did our trade repository, uh, the initial concept was actually to have a, a singular repository of data information so that regulators around the world could see concentrations of risk in their marketplace, but also across the marketplace. And we did some analysis uh, that showed where you could look at credit default swaps and just by simple modeling see if that if you stress the system you had exposure of Japan to the United States or United States to France, or you saw a big concentration in a company called AIG. And you could actually see that. That was the concept behind the trade repositories. Regulators, and not for, for lack of reasoning, all designed the trade repositories differently because they were very focused on their own needs, their own wishes of their singular marketplace. But what you'd lost at that point was that ability to globally link exposures. Uh, we did a uh, white paper on inter interconnectedness risk mm -hmm. last year. 
it is the most complex of all the risks. But you, isn't, it, isn't it always like this, that every crisis, in a sense, is unique? Um, it's similar, but it's also unique, uh, and it will never be exactly the same as the last. Oh, you always plan for the last crisis. We're yeah. perfectly ready for the 2008 <laughs> crisis. We got it down. So there was a, an experience that you have that you have that, that you told me about when you on your first day as as CEO of of DTC, DTCC. Can you can, can you tell us about it because it it shows how things are really changing yeah. and that risk new risks are are emerging. Yeah. Risk that we don't think about that much. Yeah, this is call yourself lucky. My first day as the CEO of uh, DTCC was Knight Capital. So the first hour, the first day, Knight Capital blew itself up. And as everybody knows, it was a, a trading algorithm um, that they had put in that triggered another program. And they ended up buying basically all the opening positions on the New York Stock Exchange. And within a matter of minutes, um, they had accumulated about a $4 billion position. And they were market making firm. They did not take on any huge positions like that. Um, so we had the process of liquidating those positions and working with them and helping them survive until the weekends so that could, they could get bought out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what happened that was fascinating and what scares me is the reason the problem was spotted was all the trades were going to the New York Stock Exchange. So the floor traders and others saw the trades happening. They called up Knight and said, you have a problem. They went back and forth. And they finally realized they had a problem. If those transactions, if you have an algorithm like that, that is actually running through the entire national market system, that it's not concentrated into one market. It could have kept running for 15 minutes, half an hour, so on and so forth, before their risk control was kicked in. That $4 billion position could have been multiples. Now, again, as a CCP, I'm responsible for liquidation. But absorbing the loss on a position of that size would have meant spreading the loss across the entirety of Wall Street. So the disruptive nature of an algo going wrong is something we are very, very concerned about. Because again, you don't see it. You don't see that concentration. You have a lot of market making firms. You have a lot of day trading firms that are out there who will argue, I take no risk at the end of the day. During the day, I'll have a risk for microseconds. So you don't have to worry about me until the clock stops in that microsecond between the buy and the sell. And that I've, we haven't gotten our heads around totally. And you know, we're, we're working on figuring out risk modeling to, to protect ourselves against that. But that's a shock that we have not seen happen so far in the marketplace. So the role mm. of, of algorithms, that, that, Professor That's a major Ray. risk factor here. Um, right? we are, we are, is we are, that we something that something you talk about <laughs> a lot in, in, in your sort of academic circles? Uh, this is certainly talked about a lot, and cybersecurity in general. Uh, now, being talked about a lot doesn't mean that people have solutions. And, uh, and, and, and here, I mean, I mean uh, as, we, uh, as I was listening to, to Michael, I mean, it, uh, it, it clearly uh, uh, opens uh, a, a lot of potential issues, including you know potential for hackers and uh, and, and and attacks, which could be <laughs> pretty serious. I think everybody you know around the certainly uh, around the world, uh, supervisors are extremely uh, extremely worried about these type of issues. And unfortunately, I, I, indeed, I think we are not completely up to speed on that. So I would I would mm -hmm. rank that as one of the big. Uh, big threats for financial markets, uh, disruption, potential threats. And how can we hedge? Where is it going to happen? I mean, it is, I always say as a CEO, I, I worry about one thing, which is everything. But the only <laughs> thing that keeps me up at night is cyber. I mean, cyber is, mm -hmm. it comes in all different forms and all different uh, ways. Um, we spend incredible amounts of money and time protecting ourselves, as does every major infrastructure, as does every bank. Uh, but it's an arms race between us and the, and the bad guys. It's really are the nation states that you really are worried about uh, when you see what happened with Sony. Um, there are you know, players out there that have a lot of time and talent and are, are looking to probe and attack. Who, who should deal with this? Which body should be taking a lead here? It is a, this is a, the, the perfect example where public-private has to work together. Right? Um, Stephen Pelovis yesterday uh, mentioned, he's talked about it openly, about have the, should, the, should national governments have networks built just for critical infrastructure? You know, it's an interesting and very complex question. You know, what happens during a resolution of after an attack? Is the industry capable? There's something called Sheltered Harbor in the U.S. where retail information is backed up uh, by banks and brokerage firms because the fear is if one bank gets wiped out and people can't get their money, you could have a run on the financial system because people say, well, if X bank records could get wiped out and I can't, they lose their money, I better pull my money out of every bank. 
So there's the method of backing up that's been created by the, the securities and banking industry to, to avoid that situation. But this is a very, very complex situation. And one, one of the issues, again, and we've been public about this, is you know, regulators, again, look at their marketplace, have very specific rules and compliance efforts for their marketplace. But something like ourselves, we're regulated by 20 different regulators around the world, mm -hmm. spend an inordinate amount of time responding to compliance issues. But that's just because I'm in compliance doesn't mean I'm fully protected. I'd rather spend my time protecting myself than filling out checklists. And that's an issue also where there are, again, the right intentions to make sure people are meeting minimum standards. <laughs> um, but it just takes a lot of time rather than saying, what's the right framework? We're, we're running out of time, and I also want to have the question, open up the floor for questions from, from the audience. But one <coughs> issue we haven't been discussing, and, we, and, and it's critical, I think, it's the role of central banks. Uh, Professor Ray, so if there is a crisis, um, what can central ba leading central banks around the world do to mitigate that with, 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 with the level of interest rates right now close to zero? Do they have any firepower left? Oh, yes, they do. I mean, as we have seen, central banks have been key players in mitigating the 2008-2009 crisis and also the euro area crisis uh, after that. Uh, so I think we can, uh, you know, be very thankful to uh, the level of intervention of central banks over this, uh, this last period. Um, central bankers were fully aware of the potential for disruption of the financial system, partly because of the 1929 uh, Great Depression experience and had learned from that. So as you have seen, there has been several levels of intervention. Some was simply getting the interest rate down, then you hit the zero lower bound. But then there has been massive, as you know, purchases of various oh. types of assets, which has been critical in restoring liquidity in some markets, particularly in the early stages of a crisis. So this is certainly, um, and, and then of course it has gone on with, as we know, the several, wall, uh, several rounds of quantitative easing and various type of market intervention also by the ECB in the form of uh, long-term refinancing operations for banks, for the banking system, so it, which is another type of, of intervention, but which also had the effect of restoring market liquidity and also uh, banks' ability, in fact, restoring their capital base uh, in a way. So, so these interventions are still, of course, uh, tools in the, in the menu, in the panoply of the central banks that they can use at any time. There if is still room they, of maneuver for the central if banks. If anything they learned, uh, they have gained some more experience okay. in using these additional tools uh, thanks to the, to the last crisis. So from that point of view, we, we know more than we did in 2008. So there was a lot of bold moves done by central bankers in 2008, which I think were the, were the right ones. Uh, however, there was also a lot of uncertainty about the effect of policies. Now we've learned some more. We can reuse those tools. Uh, and of course, um, you know, depending when the next crisis hit, which we all hope won't be in 2008, uh, the, the interest rate will have time possibly to go back up to some, some extent. So it will give us another, another room of maneuver as well there. You agree with that? Never, un never underestimate the power and the ingenuity of the central banks. I think that's what it comes down to. They, they are remarkable for their ability to deal with crises, go back to the Mexican crisis, go back to 2008. They will uh, figure out something. They, they will figure out something. So, Because the interest rate back in 2008, the American interest rate was around 4 or 5%, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. So there was room. There was room. Back yeah. then. So that's one tool that may be taken out of their quiver, but there are, other tool belt, there are other tools. Depends how, how, back, uh, yeah. how much far back we, we go. But I just want to say the fact that central bankers can you know, be very helpful in crisis should not induce moral hazard in the financial no. system. No obviously. moral hazard. No and moral hazard. Uh, there has to be a lot more uh, done in, in order to manage risk before central bank interventions. You know, it's not desirable that central banks are too often in, in that game, obviously. They should it, not be. Nobody wants to go back to the days of pre Dodd Frank or pre reform. I, I, I don't think any bank CEO will say they want to go back to those risk profiles. I think they've gotten comfortable that there is a new business model and it's hard to get a, a high ROE right now given the capital, but they also feel much more secure that the system's much safer. Okay, let's, let's open up the floor for, for questions. If, if there is any here in, in the room, anyone that wants to ask a question, please. So Mike, and state your name. talk about this Pollyannish environment we're in. What do you think is the potential catalyst for things going wrong and volatility coming back with a vengeance? And can this um, central bank normalization, shrinking of balance sheets and moving away from risk assets 
is, is that a potential trigger? And if not, what, where, where do you see the danger, I guess? It's, it's what we said. Unfortunately, you can't see the crisis coming. If you could, you would avoid it. Um, it could be a geopolitical event. It could be a massive cyber attack on critical infrastructure. You know, what, if, what if North Korea attacked the U.S. electrical grid successfully? What would that be to the marketplace? So I think it's, it's the two steps of a placid, um, low volatility market combined with an you know, external event of, of consequence. What if North Korea launches a missile over Japan and all of a sudden it veers off course and actually hits Hokkaido? You know, what are the ramifications of that? What does Japan do? Is there a housing collapse in China? So I think it's not going to be here is the crisis, here is the, and you go back to the 2008, it was the over leverage, but it's primarily the lending into the housing market that was the big, I think, catalyst behind that and all the follow on ramifications. I think in this situation, it's the market's ability to absorb the great unknown of whatever it could be. And if, whatever it's going to cause the crisis, it's nothing we talked about today. So can I, can I yeah, just add please. to that? So, so I, I, I agree that any kind of this type of events could be a, a shock, but I think the, the magnitude of the shock will be uh, uh, more likely to be uh, disruptive it is in, if it operates indeed in an environment in which liquidity is withdrawn, maybe at a higher rate than has been anticipated by markets. So this is why I think it's interesting to, uh, to look at whether, for example, the current uh, uh, fiscal uh, package uh, of the Trump administration could lead uh, to uh, the Fed tightening uh, quicker than expected by the market. Uh, and, uh, and if so, and if liquidity is withdrawn a little bit at a, at a higher rate than anticipated, I think any type of this shock would probably uh, be more potent. Question there. I think that will be the final question before before we close. Thank you, Chris Akers. Uh, Mr. Bautzen, um, obviously you're overseeing most transactions, um, but where do you see the biggest concentration risk as of today? Obviously, 2007, 2008, it was in the mortgage space. But where do you see, if you look at asset classes as of today? Oh, Bitcoin. Um, no, uh, I, I think it, 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 it's. I don't see a particular asset class that's extended. I think it's what Helene said, that the low interest rates uh, have pumped up all assets. I mean, housing prices are back you know, to 2008 levels in the United States. The stock market obviously is hitting new highs. Bonds are overpriced historically. Um, commodities don't seem to be quite as frothy. Um, cryptocurrencies, I mean, $350 billion, give or take, in terms of market value, I think are a bubble, but they're not large enough to the impact of man on the street. So I think that's, that's one of the difficulties. I can't sit here and go, look at this one space. You know, it, the, there's a real concentration there. Everything, I think, is, is extended and is based upon a, a very rosy forecast, which I don't think is, is, is crazy, given everything that's going on. But again, what happens when something veers off course? Professor Ray, concentration of risk, any asset class that you are particularly worried about? No, I, I, I fully agree with uh, Michael on that point. I think, uh, yes, the, uh, the low interest rate environment has popped up pretty much a lot of valuations. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, if, uh, if risk premia widen, it's going to be a price correction across the board in a number of markets. And a wealth effect, I guess. And a wealth effect, so again, playing very differently depending on the different countries because there's a lot of heterogeneity in transmission from wealth to, uh, to consumption uh, across, uh, across borders. And how much will a wealth effect hit the, the real economy? Well, that's, that's precisely that's my the, point. That's it, the diff that's it, it depends a lot on the country. Consumption will go down. Well, it depends yeah. very much on the country you look at. I mean, estimates of that vary greatly between the US and continental Europe, for example. Okay, on that partly optimistic, partly pessimistic <laughs> note. We thank you very much indeed for, for joining us here today and thank you all thank for you. attending. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.